It said Barnabas in Acts 11:22 and following, when he had seen the grace of God, he was glad. When I come to the Forest Hill congregation and when I am involved in any way with the Memphis School of Preaching, I see the grace of God and I'm glad. So very thankful am I for the great work that's gone on at this place over the years and the many individuals who have been well trained to go out with the gospel. What can you say about Dan Cates? He has a fantastic knowledge of a lot of subjects. And being around him is always a joy. But I don't know a finer Christian man than Dan Cates. Truly, he is a man in whom there is no guile. So thank you for those gracious words. Game, set, match. When it comes to timeless truths, here is one that no one should ever forget. You will never successfully debate God. You will never successfully debate God. No one is going to outsmart the Almighty. The Lord God omnipotent reigns. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Revelation 19, 6 and Revelation 19 and verse 16. No one is going to outwit omniscience. He knows what's in man, John 2, 24 and 25. He knows all things, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 20. No one is going to catch the Lord in a mistake. He is the spotless, sinless Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. John 1 and verse 29. Now when you look at Matthew chapter 22, the chapter in which we find the specific passage for our study this hour, really the, the text is all about questions. Questions. When my children were growing up, I thought my kids asked a lot of questions. Then I became a grandpa. And then I started teaching in a preacher's training school and learned even more about questions. But Matthew chapter 22 is a passage that especially deals with questions. And when you look at Matthew chapter 22, four questions are asked. Three questions are asked by people that would have to be classified as foes of Jesus. I mean, really, that's the only way to think about it. But the fourth question is asked by Jesus himself in Matthew 22, verses 41 through 46 and is an extremely crucial question concerning identity. The Lord is the master of every circumstance. Isn't that a marvelous thing to think about? The Lord is the master of every circumstance. And when we think about Jesus, we often refer to him, and rightly so, as the master teacher. Never a man so spake, John 7, 46. They were astonished at his doctrine because he taught as one having authority and not as one of the scribes. Matthew 7, 28 and 29. I still am in awe of the master teacher. Not just his teaching, but his life in person. You see, the master teacher is the master questioner. Jesus never asked a question that he didn't know the answer to. 
And yet he asked a number of questions and always to provoke thought among his hearers and response. But the master teacher is not just the master questioner. He is also the master answerer. Imagine the ability to say the right thing always in the right way and at the right time. I have often prayed for that as a gospel preacher, the ability to say the right thing at the right time in the right way. To be more like the master teacher. But in approaching the great commandment in Matthew 22, verses 34 through 40, let's first look at the questions of the chapter more thoroughly. All right? Those four questions, because when we get a good grasp of the questions and their answers we will appreciate even more the great truth about loving God with all of one's heart and soul and mind as recorded in Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 through 40. The first question is asked in Matthew chapter 22, verses 15 through 22. You have a strange pairing Asking this question, you have Herodians and disciples of the Pharisees, or as I'm fond of calling them, Pharisee wannabes. You have disciples of the Pharisees and Herodians asking the question, and the question is a political one. It involves Caesar and tribute, you will recall, Matthew 22, 15 through 22. You have the Herodians who were power hungry and greedy. The Herodians, that very term, Herod, tells us all we need to know if they are Herodians. And you have disciples of the Pharisees, a striking expression. Disciples of the, one who, of the ones who are the separate ones, who want to be dedicated to God and to His will. And on the surface, this sounds noble, and undoubtedly it was initially. But as time went on, the Pharisees prostituted the very purpose for which they may have originated. Wannabe Pharisees and Herodians, strange bedfellows, but they come together to test Jesus. It's amazing the alliances that are formed against Jesus. Even now that is true. And so the question is asked concerning politics. And the response of Jesus is astounding. He asks, whose image is on this coin? And they say, Caesar's. And Jesus responds, render unto Caesar's what is Caesar's, and unto God's what is God's. You see, humanity bears the image of God, Genesis 1, 26 through 28. And notice how the section concludes in verse 22, those present marveled. They were blown away. They were expecting to maybe catch Jesus off guard so that he would say something uh, maybe against Rome that would get him in trouble with Rome or that he would say something against 
the law that might get him in trouble with the legal experts. And they marvel. Look at verses 23 through 33 of Matthew chapter 22. Now the Sadducees come along. The Sadducees being that group that accepted only the first five books of Moses, that denied the resurrection. And the question asked by the Sadducees on this occasion, ladies and gentlemen, is this. It has to do with the theological and doctrinal question. A theological and doctrinal question about marriage and the resurrection. When you read these verses, verses 23 through 33, just following the question can be a little bit confusing, but Jesus was never confused. And notice what happens. Jesus refers to one of the very Old Testament books that they believed came from the revelation of God. Exodus. Chapter 3 and verse 6. And what he says, brothers and sisters, is that God said, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then listen to what follows. He is not the God of the dead, but the living. And the text says... They were astonished at his doctrine. <coughs> Verses 34 through 40. The third question. Now the Pharisees are going to take a shot. And they're going to hit him with their best shot. They get one of their own after they huddle up. They get one of the very best representatives of Phariseeism, a scribe, a scholar, and he is the one who will act on their behalf. And when you look at Matthew 22, 34 through 40, there is an ethical question. Out of all the commandments, out of all the commandments, what is the greatest? What is first and foremost? Talk about keeping the main thing, the main thing. What is the main commandment? More about that shortly. The fourth question. Matthew 22, 41 through 46. It's a personal question. I'd really like to know your answer to this. Jesus is asking. How will you respond? After all, you've been asking me questions and I have responded. Now respond to my question. And the question is, if David called him Lord, how is he his son? And you know what the text says? No one was able to answer him a word. And from that day forward, neither did any durst ask him any more questions. 
you see, the master answerer is the master questioner. Jesus. And he is the way, the truth, and the life. John 14, 6. Now, before we place the focus on Matthew 22, 34 through 40, some concluding observations are in order regarding the questions and how they provide a framework for the study of this text. The first question in Matthew 22, 15 through 22 had to do with rulers and authority. And Jesus is the sovereign Lord. The second question was theological and doctrinal in nature concerning marriage and the resurrection and whose wife will this woman be in the resurrection. But when they asked the question, they were looking at the very one who revealed the Old Testament and they're looking at the one who is the revealer of the new. You talk about missing an opportunity. Third, there is an ethical question posed by this leading Pharisee. What is the great commandment? Undoubtedly, this was the kind of question that they had speculated about a great deal. And the Pharisees thought that they had Jesus on their home turf, so to speak. But the one to whom they addressed the question is the creator of heaven and earth. And then the question about identity. If David called him Lord, whose son is he? Whether one was a Herodian, a Pharisee wannabe, a Sadducee, or a Pharisee, on that occasion, every person should have left saying that a greater than Solomon has arisen. And there is no stumping the Messiah, the King. Now we are ready for Matthew 22, 34 through 40. When you look at this section, it drips with irony. And... Beloved, there are three ironic twists that I hope you'll see in Matthew 22, 34 through 40, this marvelous passage from which we talk about the great commandment. Here's the first ironic twist. We see supposedly godly men meeting for an unholy purpose. We see supposedly godly men meeting for an unholy purpose. When you look at the beginning of verses 34 through 40, it tells us that Jesus silenced. He muzzled. The same terms used in Mark 1, 24 and 25 and 1 Timothy 5 and verse 18. Don't muzzle the ox. The Lord had silenced them, the Sadducees. And I'm sure there was something in the Pharisees that caused them to say, well, <laughs> that was kind of impressive. 
And then what they do is call an unholy huddle. Huddle up, Pharisees! They gather together. They gather together to test, to tempt, and to discredit the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if that is not supposedly godly people gathering together for an ungodly, unholy purpose, I don't know what is. Now, I can imagine one of the Pharisees saying, We have got to stop Jesus. I can imagine others saying, what will be the best way to try to discredit him, to get him to maybe fall into a trap or snare? The master teacher would not be ensnared. Several observations are in order. Number one, the Pharisees were the ones who loved the law, had dedicated themselves to being separate from all that would defile and dedicated and committed to God in the Old Testament. And yet we see supposedly godly people Meeting for an unholy purpose. I wonder if that can occur today. Surely it's possible that supposedly godly people can meet for an unholy purpose. To speak, to think, and act in a way that does not honor and glorify God. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 31. And don't you know that it must have broken the Lord's heart to see supposedly godly people behaving in such an unholy manner. I wonder, wasn't there one Pharisee in that group that would say this as they broke? They came into the huddle, ready, break, and now they're going to attack Jesus. And not one said... May the words of our mouths and the thoughts of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my rock and redeemer. Psalm 19, 14. Have you, as one bought with the precious blood of Jesus, ever behaved in an unholy way? Were our words and our thoughts and our actions hurt the very one who loved us and gave himself for us? Another observation. In considering this idea of supposedly godly people behaving in an unholy way to have a form of godliness but to deny the power, 2 Timothy 3 and verse 5, to be ever learning but really never able to get it, 2 Timothy 3 and verse 7. And that's what's happening in Matthew 22. I want you to know that this observation, secondly, is in order. If the sinless Lamb of God, whose words were always appropriate, and whose influence was always godly, was not embraced 
by people in the world, even religious people. We should not be surprised when our less than perfect words and influence aren't either. For those of us who preached, after everything I've said and done for this individual over the years, they're stabbing me like this in the back. Shepherds in the flock of God saying, I've loved them and cared for them and been there for them. And now they spewed this kind of venom about me. If that happened to Jesus, the master, the servant is not above his master. Now those occasions ought to make us more humble. God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. James chapter 4. Be clothed in humility. 1 Peter chapter 5. And we ought to praise God for His goodness. And we need to understand that He's still working on us and that we're still trying to draw closer to Him as well. Here's another observation. Oh, I would have loved to have heard the apostles at the end of this day. Did you hear what our Lord did? Did you hear how He responded in every case to their questions? Did you hear the question that He asked and none of them were able to say a word and no one is going to ask Him any more questions? Case closed. Game set. Match. And the apostles were going to need to remember that because by the end of the week, Jesus will be crucified. You and I need to remember to whom shall we go. You have the words of eternal life, John 6, 68. And oh, how he must have impressed them with that on this occasion. Second question, second point rather. As we deal with twist of irony, we see supposedly godly people behaving in the unholiest of ways. But secondly, we see an expert in the law attempting to tempt the master teacher. Now that's the way our irony is. Because as we're reading it, we know it's not going to turn out well for these people, don't we? We know it's not going to turn out well. And so they get an expert, a scribe. It may well be someone very much like Gamaliel. But remember the words of Gamaliel in Acts 5 and verse 39? No one is going to overcome God, and we better be careful lest we be found to be fighting against God. This type of attitude... It's precisely that. In Psalm chapter 2 and verse 2, quoted in Acts 4, verses 26 through 28, the rulers took counsel among themselves concerning Jehovah and His anointed. It is quoted in Acts 4, where religious leaders huddle up And see, their motivation is not to do anything other than try to expose and discredit the Son of God. Psalm 
so the expert will come to Jesus. Here's what they were thinking, I suspect. Maybe they were thinking, since Jesus had said earlier in the book of Matthew, Matthew 5, 17 and 18, I did not come to destroy the law but fulfill it. Maybe they thought that Jesus would speak disparagingly in some way about Moses. Maybe they thought that Jesus would give them just this much that they could stretch out into all kinds of lies and innuendo and rumor and that would damage the credibility of Jesus. No. That may have been their thinking. But Christ is the end of the law, Romans 10 and verse 4. Moses pointed to him and said, A prophet like me will arise, and to him will you hearken. Deuteronomy 18, 15 through 19. Both were deliverers. Both were revealers of God's divine message. But it's not even close. Jesus is greater. Moses pointed to Christ. As does the law and the prophets. Luke 24, 44 through 49. So you see an expert in the law attempting to test or tempt Jesus. And it's the same term that's found in Matthew 4, verses 1 through 3, of the devil tempting Jesus. Talk about supposedly godly people behaving in an unholy manner. They were far more like the God of this world than the God that they claimed to love and serve. Next. Now let's focus on the passage up close. This ironic twist. Jesus, who is the Word, will always get the final word. When you read the Gospel of Mark, it talks about the man who asked the question, the Pharisee, and does so indicating that he has some integrity. Well, I would hope so, that if he had a shred of, a th of any integrity, it should have come out in this conversation. But the emphasis in Matthew is that Jesus is the King and the Messiah and that He will always have the authoritative and final word. And so when the question is asked, what is the great commandment, which is the most important one, 613 of them, I understand 248 are positive because there's 248 body parts. Don't ask me to start naming them. And 365 for 365 negative commandments, days of the year. They come up with this. Which of the 613 is the most important? And notice Jesus immediately responds, talking about his meditation on the Word, and his answer is biblical. His answer is thoughtful. His answer is to the question that is asked is concise and it's easily understood. Preachers, take a note. Young men, take a note. Those studying to preach. When we answer, when we preach, when we teach, the answer better be a biblical answer. The answer that is given better be thoughtful. Because too much preaching is unbiblical and thoughtless. The answer Jesus gave was concise. Land the plain. Preachers land the plain. I tell you what, I flew here and I talk about when a flight is good. It's not because I got my Diet Coke, which I love to drink, and peanuts or pretzels from Southwest. It's because the pilot lands the plane well. How come some preachers can't land a plane? 
They can't conclude. If you're a golfer, you can't putt to save your life. Doesn't matter what kind of a wood game you've got or what kind of game you've got with your irons. If you cannot putt, you must be concise and you must be easily understood, not confusing. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. Too much Christianity today is heartless. You must love the Lord your God with all your soul. Too much Christianity today is soulless. You must love the Lord your God with all your mind. Too much Christianity so-called today is mindless. We are to love God with our all. Everything that makes us the people we are. And while we're to love God completely, and there's still an emphasis with all your, with all your, with all your, with all thine in the passage. And may God help us to humbly pray. Help me love the Lord my God with all of my heart and soul and mind even more. As we conclude, we need to be baptized in the great commandment. We need to immerse ourselves in the great commandment. I want to baptize my heart and my soul and my mind in the glorious truth that I am to love the one who loves me with my all. And that I am to love my neighbor as myself. Think about this, brother or sister, as we leave this building soon and go out into the world. You will never look on the face of another human being who does not matter to God. How well we convey that to others may be the difference in a person coming to Christ. You'll never look on the face of another human being who does not matter to God. And while the two commandments of Matthew 22, 34 through 40, loving God and loving neighbor, can be distinguished, they can never be separated. Because no one truly loves God who doesn't love others. And no one understands very much about how to love others without coming to a greater awe of God's love for us. Oh, what a teacher. The master teacher, the master questioner, the master answerer. Oh, what a Lord and God.